Welcome back guys. So earlier today, I actually went through this exact scenario and breakdown of exactly why uh, the seller would sell to me subject to. Today I want to talk to you guys about what I'm actually going to do with this property and why I bought it as a real estate investor and how I'm going to be taking it down and the extra strategy behind it. So I did the whole entire breakdown. Click the description below if you want to see that video for the breakdown I did here when I bought it via subject to. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys about breakdown and exactly the exit strategy of what I'm doing here. So my exit on this deal, this property, the principal interest taxes insurance is $2,600 a month. So when I'm taking my deals down, the first thing that I'm looking at is how much rent can I get long-term rental? The market is dictating that as a LTR, I can only get $2,300 a month. Now for a lot of my students, I always tell them, if you're doing your first deal, the most important thing for you to do is always to make sure that you can always break even on a long-term rental. Now, as you guys, a lot of you guys know, I actually take down a lot of my deals in Florida and being that the, insur the insurance is crazy here because the insurance hikes have gone up 20 to 30% every single year. It's been freaking bananas. Um, the property taxes have gone up through the roof. I mean, everything has gone up through the nation, right? It's not just Florida. But as you can see here, at $2,600 a month, I'm actually losing $300 a month and I'm not even breaking even. So if you're new and you don't want to take higher risk, it's important whatever deal that you take down via subject to, that at least breaks even to your principal interest tax insurance. So this is PITI, principal interest taxes insurance, okay? Now, I always look at the deal and say, hey, how much is the principal interest tax insurance that I'm gonna take over for Suzy Q, which was up here? And that's the video I, I did a second ago. So I already looked at the market, it wasn't predicting that I can at least break even. So I always look at it as like, can I do a uh, can I do an STR short term rental? That's an exit strategy. With this particular property, automatically I discard it from short term rental because I actually make a quick call to the city or county to see if I can do a short term rental. Not only that, the reason why this property does not fit the short term rental criteria buy box is because I already know that the property doesn't have a pool. So I can stop right there. The zoning doesn't fit and the property doesn't have a pool. And there's nothing unique about this property for me to even continue to evaluate a short term rental property. So there's no reason why I need to keep going down that rabbit hole. A lot of you guys who have been following me know that one of my most prevalent exit strategies that I'm actually doing right now in today's environment because things are so expensive is pad split. Now, there's a lot of different exit strategies out there. You just don't have long-term rental, you just don't have short-term rental, you just don't have pad split. You could do wraparound mortgages, you could do all different types of exit strategies, you can do lease options, but the ones that I like to stick to are the ones that I know and the ones that I, that I use in my investment uh, journey. So short-term rental doesn't work. Then I looked at the property and when I walked the property, it was actually a property that was a three bedroom, two bath home. And Matt was actually with me when I walked this property. We walked it at nighttime. This property was a three bedroom, two bath house. Now, when I walked the property, I wasn't sure if it could even be a pad split. And the first thing I do when I'm analyzing if it could be a pad split is I actually go to Simple Enough, a website that you guys all know, which is Google. Google, right? When I go to Google, I do a street view to see if the property has adequate parking, where are sidewalks, where are the bus stops, where are the restaurants, where are all the basic jobs in that area? So when I go to Google and it meets my criteria of having the route of parking, being in the correct location, being near bus stops, etc., I will then walk the property and see if the floor plan is suitable to become a pad split. 
Be in that we're an environment where things are so expensive, affordability is very tough, and there's actually not enough affordable housing. So what I like to do with my properties is typically take a three bedroom, two bath home, and I convert them into a seven or eight bedroom two, uh, bath home. So this same exact home actually got converted after I walked it and I said, you know what, Matt? What do you think? Does this look like a good pad split? We walked it, we're like, I remember you said this. You're like, man, this is a no brainer. Yeah. They had the square footage because this property was actually 2,300 square foot, right? Yeah. It's a 2,300 square foot property and it was a 3-2 property. Think about that for a second. Most three twos are like 1,500 square foot. This was a 2,300 square foot property. There was tons of space. It was ridiculous amount of house space they were. So what I end up doing was I took the living room, living, uh, living room, dining, and I converted those into bedrooms. So I'm at three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom. There was actually a small additional living room area uh, next to the foyer right when you walked in. And I converted that into a room. And then lastly, I actually converted the garage into a bedroom as well. Right? So we're at three bedrooms, four bedrooms, five bedrooms, six bedrooms, seven bedrooms. I converted the existing floor plan of a three bedroom, two bath home into now a seven bedroom two bath house. So what I end up doing is the way I analyze to see if I, this makes sense for me to see if I'm going to take this deal down is I have to go through a process of underwriting. Now we all know that there's expenses to buying a home and maintaining a home. So even though I have to pay here the principal taxes insurance. So let's talk about expenses for a second. Okay. So we have uh, principal interest, taxes, insurance, which is $2,600 a month. That means I make that one payment to the bank every single month. They're handling my insurance, they're handling my taxes, and the principal and interest obviously goes to the bank. Pretty straightforward there. We have lawn. What else we got, Matt? Internet. Internet. Cleaning. Enter, all right. Uh, th th this property I'm paying Internet, I'm paying $75 a month. My lawn care is $100 a month. They come by weekly. Uh, cleaning fee, the cleaner comes uh, once a month. That's at $125. Okay. Uh, we are at what? What else? Cap CapEx? Power, yeah, CapEx. CapEx. Uh, Capital X, by the way, guys, for you guys just watch this not understanding. Everything in a home has a certain lifespan. Your roof, your AC, your plumbing, stuff like that. You as an investor should always have an oh shit day fund. Because at some point in time, you're going to have to replace the roof. You're going to have to replace the kitchen cabinets. You're going to have to replace ACs, floors, etc. Right? There's a lot of components to a property. So your CapEx budget or your capital expenditures, I like to say if the property is fully updated, and you have to, you've done minimum minimum renovations are needed to be done, or if any, like that property in um, uh, Palm Coast. Yeah. That one, would you agree, didn't need any renovations? Yeah. The roof was good. That was it within adequate uh, uh, life. The AC was just replaced. The plumbing was good. The electrical was good. The home was built in uh, 1990, right? So this property was built in 1990. Built in 1990, and I per personally love to find homes minimum of 1990 or newer, but I will go as low as 1975. And the reason why is because in 1975 or before, I try to avoid the properties that have cloth wiring. I try to avoid the properties that have uh, cast iron piping. I try to avoid the properties that are like a nuisance to these freaking insurance companies that want to charge an arm lane to get insurance. And a lot of times what I have found with these properties, these things haven't been updated. Unless they have been fully gutted and updated, then I'll consider something maybe a little bit older. But stick to your buy box. And we've talked about buy box a lot if you guys have been following the journey, my journey. So we're at principal interest tax insurance, lawn, internet, cleaning fee, CapEx. And CapEx, I usually say if it's a home that is newer, you could do 10% a month or you can do as low as 5% a month. Depends on your risk tolerance. Depends on how much money you want to put to the side. 
Uh, and that's your total income. So if the property's making, let's say $5,000 a month, you could do 10%, which is 500, or you could do 5%, which is 250. In this scenario, we'll do $250 in CapEx. So we have lawn, internet, CapEx, we have uh, management, right? Management fee every single month. Power, uh, uh, this, power. Yeah, power. yep. We have uh, uh, power. Power, <laughs> that's a variable cost, guys. And my power bill at this particular property is about $300 a month. Sometimes it goes up to $350, sometimes it goes to $375. Uh, but if you take your electric bills for the whole entire rolling 12 months, if you've owned it for that long and you do an average number, I haven't owned this property for 12 months, but right now my, my electric bills have been anywhere between $300 to, $300 to $350 a month on this, this property. So that's $300 a month. Um, my VAs, okay, they get paid about 130 a month, okay? Uh, and my VAs are the ones who manage the property. They're the ones who do all the guest messaging. They're the ones who uh, coordinate with the, the vendors. They do all that stuff. And I've hired them off of Upwork. If you guys go to a website called Upwork, let me, let me write it down here because a lot of people aren't familiar with this website and I don't know why. Upwork is where I hire my VAs. Guys, it took me years and years and years and years, and I'm not kidding you. It took me years to learn to hire VAs to do all the nitty gritty work. Remember, you wanna turn this into a semi-passive business. Obviously, it's not 100% passive, but you wanna turn this into a semi-passive business. That way, you're not worried about the nitty gritty and you can focus on other stuff and you're not getting calls about leaky toilets. You're not getting calls about, oh, Bobby in room one is fighting with Susie in room two. Uh, so, all right, where we're at. So, principal interest tax insurance, lawn, internet, uh, uh, a cleaning fee, CapEx, power. Oh, what about vacancies? Huh? Vacancies, again, you're going to you're gonna factor in, uh, you can factor in 5% a month for that as well. That's 250, okay? You could do a little bit higher if you want, but you're going to be anywhere with CapEx and vacancies. A lot of people will do always a rule of thumb of 10% of the gross revenue. And then vacancies, a lot of people do 5 to 10%, depending on what your exit strategy is. Um, here being that we stay a lot more full on the property because we rent out per bedroom, our vacancies are a lot lower than somebody who's renting a single family home. Now, we have vacancies cap X uh, and we have about uh, pad split fee, which we'll get into that in another video, but we're going to get into that here in a second so you guys understand what the pad split fee is, right? And on this property, pad split fee, um, I'm at... I grossed last month $4,000, right? So $4,000, I have to pay them 8% every single month. That's for the pad split fee, the, the new 8% that, they, that they're that they charging. So $800 a month, okay? Yeah, eight, or three twenty dollars a month. What am I doing? Three twenty dollars a month. Come on, Matt. You're supposed to keep me on track here. I'm paying them three twenty dollars a month. So... This all starts to add up, guys. Like you're probably like, man, that's a lot of cost for me to operate this property. So it's important for you to understand that you paying all these things as a pad split operator, you need to know if it makes sense. Let's add these up. 2,600, Matt, yep. 100, 75, 20, 125, yep. 250, yep. 300, yep. 130, 250, and pad split uh, fee is three, 3,200 a month. Uh, 4,400. 4,400. Total equals 4,400, okay? After we tallied up all these fees, I need to make minimum of $4,400 a month to now break even, meaning you have a stabilized asset if you break even at 4,400 a month. Now, typically you need to be 4,400 a month for at least three to four months to really consider it a stabilized asset. But at $4,400 a month, me as the real estate investor, I'm breaking even, I'm good, I'm fine, okay? I'm not coming out of pocket to pay for this home. So with pad split, what I do is I'll run through and I'll say, okay, I, cre I can create this into seven bedrooms. Now I need to go, I need to go to a website like Zillow.com. We all know Zillow. Apartments.com. Uh, 
okay? Uh, you can go to MLS. You can go whatever source that you want to gather data from. But most people won't have MLS, but you can use MLS if, you, if you're a real estate agent. Apartments.com, MLS. And what you need to do is you need to figure out what studio apartments are going for in this market. In my market that I was that I was in, uh, studio apartments were going for, and this is the Florida market. At the time when I did the underwriting, they were going anywhere between twelve to fourteen hundred dollars a month. So what I did was I gathered five different properties from these this these websites here. I want you to gather five properties. Let's talk about this here. I got five properties. And what I figured out was, uh, what I ended up figuring out was out of the five properties, my average long-term rental rate for a studio apartment was about $1,200 a month, okay? So what I end up doing is I'll take that $1,200 a month and I'll take it and typically discount it by 20 to 30%. So let's do 30% in an example here. That's $360 minus $1,200. That gives me $840 a month per room. We went to Zillow.com, Apartments.com, or MLS. We picked five properties. We came out with the average of $1,200 out of the five. We found, well, we're going based on averages, guys. Out of the five properties that we picked that were in that same zip code, we came up with an average of $1,200 a month, okay? From $1,200 a month, I took 30%, okay? So we did 1,200 times 0 .30. That's $360 a, a, a month. So the average was 1,200 a month, and I did a 30% discount. Why do I do a 30% discount? And I do anywhere between 20 to 30%. Because obviously, if somebody's gonna go to Zillow, uh, apartments.com, or MLS and get a studio apartment, what do they have to do? They have to put first, last, and security. They have to get the background check, credit check, employment verification. The entry to barrier is a lot higher, obviously. And it costs that individual a lot more money because they have to pay for furniture, power, internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, I discount it 20 to 30% because this is what I have found. 20 to 30%, I discount it, which is 360. What I have found is I'm giving myself a discount of figuring out why would somebody go to my room's rentals and my property versus a studio apartment. The next progression for this individual is to go to a studio apartment. Would you agree, Matt? Yeah. So 20 to 30% gives is a discount off of what they would get if they were to rent a bedroom in my home that I just created at a seven bedroom, two bath home, okay? So average of five properties is 1,200. So now we come up with 1,200 minus 360, right? We're at 840. So now I know with seven bedrooms, I can get about $840 a month. That's on the on the higher side, by the way. That's a more, those are gonna be more of the premium rooms in that house. So I'm gonna start, that means as a pad split because these individuals are renting the properties on a weekly basis. So at 840 divided by four weeks, we're about 210 a week, right? 210 and the bigger rooms that I created in the home, like I did the garage, I did the, the master bedroom. Um, some of the bigger rooms, the one that I had the, the, the porch, I don't know if you remember uh, that property, those ones I'm charging more of a premium. So on the low end, so even I'm at 1200 on the average, minus 360. So I come up with the per room on pad split. Per room. I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna go on the low end of 210 per month. So I'm at 210 per month, or 210 per week, excuse me. I'm at 210 per week, which is 840 a month, per month that I could potentially be getting for every single bedroom in the home. Now, we all know that if I look at this property, that doesn't mean I'm gonna have 100% occupancy in this, in this uh, property. But, being that I'm gonna market to where there actually is no other pad splits, 
And I'm actually cornering the market and I told Matt this. I said, my idea is to corner the market because there's no other path splits. What I have found in these markets that are secondary markets, it takes longer to fill the bedrooms, right? Because obviously pad split, which is a national company, if you go to padsplit.com, they're a national room rental company, meaning co-living. And I can either go and do this on my own or I can hire a pad split. Why I like to hire a is because they streamline the process. They do all the marketing. They do all the background, credit checks, employment verification. They do not manage the property. A lot of people get confused. So down here, when I put the pad split management fee, that's what they charge every single month out of the gross revenue. They don't manage the property. My VAs manage the property. So my total of $4,400 a month. So this is a, uh, this is a, a seven bedroom uh, property, okay? Now, I actually have bedrooms higher than my 210 a month in this house. So the, the garage, that's 250 a month on that one. I want to remember this number because this is the total. So the garage is actually getting 250 a month. And my God, she is freaking happy. Loves it. I've created it to where it's like a studio apartment. She's got like a little couch in there, TV, coffee table. Fantastic. My premium sunroom, which I call my sunroom because it's got a nice little porch on the side of it. It's got its own private porch. It's got a, actually another sliding glass door so they can access to the backyard. Um, that property, that room is getting $236 per week. Sorry, guys. This is per week. I keep saying per month. I'm so used to talking in month. <laughs> uh, per week. So at $250 a week, $236 a week. My smaller room, and this is the sunroom. My smaller room, my smallest room in the home, which is room number one, they're not getting the premium luxury stuff that these individuals are getting. They're just getting a bed, a closet, a TV. They're not getting a, a private um, a refrigerator. That one's actually at 189 a week. Put small room. Okay. Uh, my other rooms, which is, uh, I have the smaller, the, sorry, the mid-tier rooms. So I'm going to put mid-tier. I have a few of these in this property. Those, those property, those rooms are getting about 220 a week. But sometimes I have to discount them to 210, 209. Sometimes I'll bring them down to 199, depending on, um, because, and with the pad split, believe it or not, depending on the seasonality of the year and stuff like that, um, even though that I'm not running a short-term rental business, there is some dynamic pricing. But those are getting uh, 220 per room per and week. How many of those do you have? I have, um, I have, I have one, two, three, so three four, X. five. Yep. So do three X next to midterm. Yep. Three X. Three X. So. so three times. So that's three, four, five, six. And then my last room on the property is doing about, it's, it's got a private, a, a private refrigerator, bed, closet. That's the one that has all the windows. I don't know if you remember next, out, right next to the kitchen. You probably don't remember that one. Um, that one is doing about 230, 230 a week actually on that one. So let's add some of these up, Matt. Let's pull the calculator out. The master convert? No, that's not the master one. Uh, uh, that's not the master one. The because we took out the master. Yeah. We t we so made that. Mid -tier? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 those are mid tier. Okay. This one you could consider a mid tier. It kind of fluctuates. Sometimes I get a little bit lower. Sometimes I get a little, a little bit higher. Um, so I'm getting that that per week. So let me see. Add, I'm gonna add these numbers up. Matt, add this one. You get a second. So I'm at two fifty times four. That's a thousand. So that's a thousand. That's a total monthly income. So I did two fifty times four. Uh, 1000 a month. Uh, so 236, right? Times four is 944. 189 times four, 756. 220 times four is 880. And then 230 times four is 920. So that's 920. So let's add these up. So we got a 6260. 
on this on this one. So, yep, yeah, two more 880s. So 6260. So I don't know if you guys remember, but earlier before I raced it, my total expenses, total expenses. expenses total were 4400 a month if i'm making 6260 gross revenue so this all comes down to total 6260 move this here 6260 so the total revenue that this property is bringing in is 6260 a month my total expenses every single month are 4,400. So guess what? I get to keep the gap, the delta. That's 1860 a month. Now, remember, that's if I'm at 100% occupancy. Being that this property is in a market, like my major metro market one here in Orlando, 100% always, like it's, it's fire hot. My, uh, my Palm Coast property, it's taking me a lot longer to get stabilized. Property's already stabilized. And this property is gonna do about 6260 a month. Uh, I only have two more rooms to fill and we're good to go there. Uh, but my Winter Park one, always 100%. So if you're underwriting, I always say, if you're gonna underwrite, underwrite at 80%. That's the, the smartest thing to do. Um, if this property was at 100% occupancy, I would be at eight. 60 net a month, right? What do we add at 80%? Matt, you got on the calculator? 5,008. 5,008 yeah. at 80% occupancy? So this is total. So let me go ahead and write this down. That's total. So let me come right here. So 5,000 what? $5,008. $5,008 a month. That's at 80%. Guys, this is at 80% occupancy. This is at 80% occupancy. This is at 100% occupancy. Now again, depending on what market you're in, you need to know what occupancy you are going to be at. I know a lot of pad split operators that are in certain markets like Atlanta market, people are like 100%. Because again, the housing is super important. People need housing, people need affordability. But let's just go ahead and use the lower number for sake to maybe my projections aren't gonna be correct and maybe guess what, things will go wrong and maybe I won't make 62.60 a month. At 80%, let's say I'm at, you said $5,008. So at $5,008 guys, $5,008 minus 4,400, yep. Got too many numbers on the board. I'm at $608 net net a month. So 608. Net, net. So, best case scenario, I would be making about $1,800 a month if it's at 100% occupied, but I'm at 608 net, net a month on this deal, okay? That's 608 times 12. Annually, annually I'm at 72.96 a month. Now, I know what you guys are probably wondering, okay, Javier, how much money do you have in this stinking deal? Okay. Now, the beautiful thing about this is, guys, you already see long term rental example, I'm losing money. Worst case scenario, and I always say underwrite worst case scenario on my pad split, this particular pad split that I'm using an example on, I'm net net 608 a month, which gives me 7296 per year. Per year, I'm at 70. To 96 per year. Okay? Net at 80%. At best case scenario, I'm in the freaking, I'm really doing good. Now remember this too, guys. You don't just buy properties just so you can make cash flow. Obviously, I'm getting tax depreciation, I'm getting future leverage, I'm getting, I can use it as collateral, I'm getting loan pay down, I'm getting all these benefits when I own the piece of real estate. And not only that, I can do cost segregations. There's so many ways I can actually manipulate this one piece of real estate. Now, I'm gonna give you guys approximate numbers of what I'm in on this deal, so you can see. Existing floor plan was a three bedroom, two bath, 
converted it into a seven bedroom, two bath. My acquisition fee, meaning what it cost me to buy the, the real estate. And again, if you guys want to see that previous video, click the description below <clears throat> and let me know in, this, in the comments, has this been helpful for you guys to see why I end up buying this property via subject two and why it was worth it for me and how I created a win-win scenario for all parties. So my, my acquisition costs, so the cost to buy it uh, was $14,600. And it took me 45 days actually to go from a 3-2, 45 days to go from a 3-2 to a 7-2. I had to get, I had to put the walls up. I had to put those two by fours up. Not me, but my crew did. I had to get the paint. I had to get the furniture installed. I had to do any minor electrical or adding ceiling fans. Like there's a lot of little moving parts. So for me to do all that, it costs money and it costs time. So for every month that I'm holding the property, what happens? You have to pay $2,600 every single month plus your electric. So these are holding costs, guys. So my holding costs on this deal every single month was not only just uh, was principal interest tax insurance, lawn, right? You gotta keep the lawn up. That was $100 a month. We spoke about that a second ago. Uh, internet, cause I, I install internet right away. Oh, internet. That's 75. And what else? Electric. Those are my main holding cost. Uh, electric bill wasn't that much every month. It was, I would say it's about 200, right? So at 75, so we're at uh, uh, lawn, that's 27, right? 28, 29, 29.75 this deal cost me to hold every single month. Twenty nine seventy five. Okay. Every single month in holding costs, I'm having to pay twenty nine seventy five to hold the property. So acquisition was four thousand six hundred to put up the walls, to do the minor electrical, to do the paint, to do the the two by fours, all the all the supplies, the labor all the minor little touches that we had to do to the property to build the closets, the door, not, all that stuff, okay, was about $20,000. I'm at $29.75 in holding costs every single month. So this was pad split reno, right, $20,000. At 45 days, Okay, and by the way, that's 45 days for me to get it up and ready on a pad split. What am I gonna have addition? I'm gonna have additional what? Another at least month before I start seeing stabilization in that? Mm -hmm. Maybe two months, maybe three months, depending on what market you're in. So it's important that you factor in, I would say if you're, if you're doing your underwriting, you should be factoring 60 to 90 days until your property is stabilized. Meaning like you're not pay, coming out of pocket for your money or your, your property every single month. So I'm going to do 2975 times 90 days, right? Yeah, so times three. Yeah. So we're at 89.25 holding cost, right? We're also at, I had to pay for a uh, mini split, which is an AC unit. Right in the garage. The garage I put on its own AC unit, which is called a mini split. That cost me $3,500. And that was also including they had to move one ductwork in the living room for where I created a bedroom. So that was $3,500 for the mini split. And that was $3,500. That also included them moving a ductwork that I had to move from the living room into that smaller bedroom right by that door the, the, on the left, right when you walked in, Matt. Uh, oh, furniture. How can I forget? 
Uh, we're looking at about 10K in furniture cost. Yes, <laughs> that's right. It's about $1,000 per bedroom for furniture for a seven bedroom home. If you do it the right way. Right, if you do it the right way. And by the way, if you want, if you click the description below, I have a whole entire shopping list and an SOP, standard operating procedure, where you can actually furnish a whole entire property within an hour. And then after that, you'll see there's a download clickable link that you can actually see the SOP that you can give over to a labor person, like off a of TaskRabbit or Thumbtack. This is where I hire all my uh, all my labors, task, rabbit. Oh my God, these things have been a game changer. Send them to the masterclass. Yep. So I can go to the masterclass. Right. Yeah. Or you can go to the masterclass, the three-day masterclass that I have created, and you can see exactly step by step by step where I've done everything from A to Z to show you guys how to properly underwrite, how to figure out what market you wanna go into, how to properly furnish, how to properly hire, all the stuff from A to Z. If you go to my masterclass in the description below, you'll see that as well. So you pick what you want, okay? Uh, so 10K in furnishings. Oh, labor cost. Uh, we were at about, to assemble a furniture, I'm about like 230 a room. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy how much it cost. Two thirty a room. Two hundred and thirty dollars in labor cost for me to hire somebody off of a task rabbit or a thumbtack. And this is where I find all my my laborers, my electricians, my plumbers, stuff like that. Um, I'm at sixteen ten. Sixteen ten. All right. So what are we at? Fourteen thousand six hundred dollars. Because I know you guys are all wondering like, okay, well, if he's making on the worst case scenario, net, net $600 a month, and best case scenario, I'm making about $1,800 a month. What is his return? Is this worth it for me to do this? Okay. So at $14,600 plus $20,000 plus, here again, holding cost, eighty nine twenty five dollars plus 3500 plus 10,000, plus 16, 10. All right, 58, 635 is the total that I'm in on this deal. 58, 635. So we can take my 608, and I'm doing worst case scenario, I'm doing at the 80% occupancy rate, times 12, which is 7296, uh, which I got written down here. So if I'm at net net, so we're gonna run this through again. 80% occupancy, which gives me $5,008, which is what Matt said. My net net, worst case scenario, is $608 and $608 a month. Per year, that's 7296 per year, okay? What are we at cash and cash returns? So let's look, let's look at this, because I always look at cash and cash return, right? So cash on cash. This is one of the metrics that people like to look at as an investor. What is my cash on cash return? You can look at cap rates as well, but what is my cash on cash return on this deal? So I'm at 68, so I'm at, or excuse me, I'm at 72.96. How much total money do I have in the deal? Which is $58,635. I'm at 12.4%, correct. 12.4% cash on cash return, worst case scenario. And if I was gonna do the best case scenario to do that really quick, which was about $1,800 a month. So best case scenario, I'm gonna do best case. So this is this right here is worst case scenario. And above this, we're gonna do best case. Right? So best case scenario, let's say I'm at that $1,800 a month. It was a little higher than 1,800, but we're gonna use 1,800 to do a quick round number. Times 12, that's $21,600 per year, okay? And remember, affordability is getting, it's getting tough. Like people, these rooms are gonna stay booked, right? That's 21,600 divided by your total money that you're in on the deal. This is how you come up with your cash on cash return. You divide your, your, your total net cash flow. So my net, net is 21, 600 for the, year. for the year, per year, okay? 
Best case scenario is $21,600 per year. Best, 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 best case scenario. We're going to divide that by the total amount of money I have in the deal, which is $58,000. 58,635. That's a 36.8% return. 36.8% return. Cash on cash. Cash on cash, baby. So we have best case scenario. Run this through for you guys again. Net net is $21,600 per year. If I take $21,600 and I divide it by my total cash in the deal, which is about $58,635, I'm going to be at a 36.8% or cash on cash return. My worst case scenario, which I always tell you guys and, I, and people who know that they've been learning from me, I always say go worst case scenario, not best case scenario, right? Your worst case scenario is you net $608 a month. Per year, that's $72.96 per year. Your cash on cash return would be about 12.4% uh, uh, cash on cash. Now, if you guys remember, this same example that I used over here, long-term rental equaled $2,300 a month. So if I was a long-term rent this three-bedroom, two-bath house, I would only be making $2,300 a month. I would My principal interest taxes and insurance, which is up here, guys, is $2,600 a month. I haven't even included vacancies in CapEx, which you should do on all your underwriting. I would be losing hundreds of dollars if I was to go and rent this thing out long-term rental. Being that I walked the floor plan like we talked about just a second ago and I converted it into a seven bedroom, two bath property and it took me 45 days to do. And once I factor in and all my cost, the acquisition, the pads of renovation, the holding cost, the mini split, the furniture, the labor, uh, and that was labor for furniture only, I'm at about $58,635 total all in in the investment. So let me ask you guys, drop a comment below. Would you, at 80% occupancy, we, we underwrote it at 80% occupancy, and then we did best case scenario at 100% occupancy. At 80% occupancy, we're going to be making $5,008 per month, okay? Long-term rental was $2,300 a month. We can absolutely scratch that, throw that away. This is looking a lot sexier, right? $5,008 a month best or is, is at 80%. This is worst case scenario. This gives us a $600, a $608 net per month, net, net, meaning after all expenses have been paid. At, for the whole entire year, we're at $72.96 per year. One of the metrics that I use, we can use a cap rate as well, but one of the metrics I use is cash on cash return when I'm investing. I would be at 12.4% if I was to buy this deal, okay? Cash on cash return. <clears throat> best case scenario, if I was to make $1,800 a month, at best case scenario, we'd be at $21,600 per year. This would give me a cash on cash return of 36.8% because I took the $21,000 and I divided it by $58,635. In the comments below, let me know, would you take this property at a minimum of 12.4% return? or 12.4% cash on cash. And if you wouldn't, what would you do? But we know that if I was to go long-term rental on this property, I would actually be in the negatives. I would be losing every single month. Now, let's just say my, my worst case scenario um, right here of $608 a month, okay? Let's use that, that worst case scenario. One of the things I want you guys to start remembering, when you're purchasing a piece of real estate, one of the things you need to look at is not just cash flow. Cash flow is not just the only thing you look at. You also want to look at loan pay down. What are some other things you want to look at, uh, Matt? Um, you have appreciation. Okay, I like that. Appreciation. You already have loan pay down, appreciation. You have um, okay. equity. What is it? Uh, not, well, with loan pay down, you have equity. You, yep. Uh, appreciation. Yeah, appreciation. Yep, perfect. Um, you get uh, collateral. Collateral. Perfect. Tax, tax, uh, tax. 27 and a half year. Tax depreciation. Tax, yep. Yeah. 
depreciation, right? 27 and a half year. Yeah, collateral. Collateral. Yes, you do get cash flow. Uh, cash flow, right? You get all these different benefits when owning a piece of real estate, okay? All these different benefits. And there's actually more than this, but you get all these different benefits. So it's important for you as the investor. Are you okay with making 12.4% on your money and getting all these benefits of owning real estate? If you're not and you're like, you know what, I can get higher returns other places, this might not be the deal for you. But for where I'm at in my investing career, I'm okay with taking a 12.4% return. Now, most long-term rentals, just so you guys know, most long-term rentals across the nation, they don't cash flow. They do not cash flow at all. They don't make any money and you're not getting a 12.4%. And if you do have a property that is cash flowing as a long-term rental, typically you're probably gonna be about long-term rental, your returns are probably, I, I've seen six, five and 6%, okay? Five and 6%, okay? You can just put your money in the money market if you wanna do that return, but obviously you're not gonna get all these benefits to owning real estate. So, Ask yourself, if you're gonna do a long-term rental, are you gonna make money? And are you gonna be able to pay for the property? And if not, are you gonna break even at least? If I say to myself, and I always tell everybody, underwrite as if you have to go worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is like, hey, you know what? None of this worked out. Pad split got wiped out. Co-living went to shit. What is my last, what is my one of my other exit strategies? My other exit strategy is, $2,300 $2, a month, I would have to lose a couple hundred dollars a month. Or I could do other extra strategies, but one of the things I'm always gonna uh, look back at is if I was to take the property and none of this scenario worked out right here, what, what happens if I went back to long-term rental? Would I make any money? Now here's the beauty. We're looking at about a national average three to 5% every single year of a rental increase. So long-term rents, long-term rentals, Typically, okay, long-term rents, they actually increase typically between three to five percent every single year. So that means that the tenant came in at 23, it's gonna increase three to five percent if that landlord's doing things correctly, right? Because what happens? Inflation goes up, things cost more, insurance, property insurance goes up. Uh, taxes go up, lawn maintenance goes up, uh, you know, his expenses, CapEx expenses go up, like things will go up over time. So if that uh, landlord is smart, over time, they're gonna be doing a rental increase every single month, okay? Um, so for me, when I took this property over subject two, I saw an opportunity in the market that we're in for us to do a pad split exit on this property. And that's the reason why I went and took this property down via subject two. And remember, if you just seen this video, I did a whole video breakdown of what subject two is and how I'm investing into subject two and seller finance deals in today's climate. And I was able to obtain a 4.75 interest rate with a debt service of $2,600 a month, which I have right here on this, on this property. I was able to obtain that without having to use my credit, my credentials, my tax returns, without having to get hounded by lenders, any of that stuff. It was a super simple process. So when you start learning the subject to tool and you put that in your tool belt, you're gonna see how much more effective you are by taking these deals down every single month or however often you want. So I want you guys to drop in the comment below. What do you guys think about pad split? Is pad split an exit strategy that you would use on a uh, start exiting on these properties that you're taking down via subject to or seller finance? Or are you more of a long-term rental guy? Or do you like lease options? I wanna hear from you guys. Let me know below. What are you guys most interested in? And if you're watching this and you've gotten to the end, I want you guys to know, I've done a full masterclass, 100% free, that I'm giving away to you guys so you guys can start understanding what pad split is and you can see my in-depth review about pad split. So I hope to see you guys on the other side. And if you thought you got any value out of today, do me a favor, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the description below.